Meat is a perfect food for your cat, but you're not a cat. You're not a carnivore. You're, whether we like it or not, the protein in meat is inferior to plant protein. Now, that's going to upset everybody who grew up with the 1950s idea that meat is great protein and eggs even better. Um, what they what they meant, and, and it's true, is that meat has essential amino acids in them. But researchers at Harvard University did an amazing study. They published, I think it was 2016, where they looked at substitution. If I'm eating meat protein, and instead I eat plant-based protein. The mortality is substantially reduced. If you eat one plant food, you will get all essential amino acids. Let me be clear about that because this was misunderstood until fairly recently. And let me say this clearly. All plants have all essential amino acid. Um, you will hear, oh, quinoa has all essential amino acids. Stop. All plants have all essential amino acids. Hi, friends. So far in over 300 episodes or so, we haven't had an advocate for the vegan diet on this show. And I feel it's really important to provide a balanced view on nutrition. And so I've been looking for an expert for some time. And I recently read a great book called The Power Foods Diet, which is all about power foods that boost your metabolism, tame your appetite, and also help to trap and flush away calories. And my guest today is the author of that book. Dr. Neil Barnard, who is an adjunct professor of medicine at the George Washington University School of Medicine in Washington, D.C., and president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Dr. Barnard has led numerous research studies investigating the effects of diet on diabetes, body weight, hormonal symptoms, and chronic pain, including a groundbreaking study of dietary interventions in type 2 diabetes funded by the National Institutes of Health that paved the way for viewing type 2 diabetes as a potentially reversible condition for many patients. He's also authored more than 100 scientific publications and 20 books for medical and lay readers and is the editor-in-chief of the Nutrition Guide for Clinicians, a textbook made available to all US medical students. While I'm not a vegan myself and I don't necessarily advocate everything in this interview, I do think there is a lot that we can learn about the power of plants and the effects that they have to support good metabolic health, microbiome and hormonal health. So enjoy this interview. So Dr. Neil Barnard, I am Super excited to have you on the show today. As we were talking just on, uh, now offline, uh, I've never had anyone that is pro-vegan on the show before. And honestly, I've been looking for the right person, I think, who really studies it, has science to to back it up, back this approach up. Um, I heard you first on the Diary of a CEO podcast. Um, I love your book. Uh, and firstly, just a very warm welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's great to be with you today. So... Um, I think a good place to kick off is uh, probably why would you say that avoiding meat is so, so much better for our health? Um, the list is a long one. Um, first of all, what meat doesn't have, it doesn't have any fiber. And fiber is really an important thing. It's a boring nutritional word, I have to admit. Um, but it's sort of the Clark Kent of nutrition. It's inside fiber is a superhero. Fiber keeps you regular. Everybody knows that. Fiber also helps reduce cholesterol levels, particularly the soluble fiber and things like oats and beans. But fiber has almost no calories. And so that means when you fill up with them, your, uh, your appetite is satisfied sooner. In other words, you might eat a couple hundred calories less if you're eating high fiber foods. And there's some really cool things that we've discovered recently, which, which were not known when I was in medical school, is that fiber can actually trap calories in your digestive tract and carry them out with the waste. And you can be flushing 100 calories a day down the toilet thanks to fiber. So meat doesn't have any. Uh, but you know what meat does have? Cholesterol. Yes, it does. Um, and it also has saturated fat in it, which is a bit the bad fat that causes your body to make cholesterol and in recent studies has been shown to be linked to Alzheimer's disease. So you don't need saturated fat at all. There's no requirement for it. The, the less you have, the better. And meat, unfortunately, gives you a lot of it. Um, also, and let me say something that is going to surprise a few people. The protein in meat is inferior to plant protein. Now, that's going to upset everybody who grew up with the 1950s idea that meat is great protein and eggs even better. Um, what they what they meant, and, and it's true, is that meat has essential amino acids in them. Um, and that plants, plants have essential amino acids too. All plants have all the essential amino acids, but they vary in amounts. But researchers at Harvard University did an amazing study. They published, I think it was 2016, where they looked at substitutions. If I'm eating meat protein, and instead I eat plant-based protein. 
the mortality is substantially reduced. And that's true for meat, that's true for dairy, it's true for eggs, it's true for all animal protein. And so the whole idea was, if all those essential amino acids are so good for us, what's the health benefit? And the answer is, there isn't one. Um, there, it's the reverse, that you're much better off getting your amino acids in the proportions that are brought to you by um, a variety of plant foods. Uh, so you need the essential amino acids, but like iron and copper and a lot of other nutrients, if you get too much, that's a bad thing. So uh, bottom line, uh, meat is a perfect food for your cat, but you're not a cat. You're not a carnivore. You're, whether we like it or not, we are great apes. Uh, our cousins are chimpanzees and gorillas, and they're not out eating sausage and, and uh, hot dogs. And, and going into meat was kind of a culinary wrong turn for us. Thank you for that. There's a few, there are a few things that sort of raised for me um, that I want to sort of circle back on. The first one is when you talk about meat containing cholesterol and saturated fat, I understand that having a higher saturated fat diet could um, sort of lead to higher levels of cholesterol and cause potential issues in the body. But my understanding was that food that contains cholesterol, dietary cholesterol, isn't the same as the cholesterol that we have. Uh, and so it's not so much of a concern, but the saturated fat is. Can you clarify that, please? Sure. It's true that there are two different things, but both of them are issues. The first is um, animals make cholesterol. Plants really effectively don't. But an animal makes cholesterol, and they make it for a good reason. If you were a potted plant, you're not going anywhere. You just have rigid cell walls, and yet if you are a human being, you've got things to do and places to go. You need flexibility. So cholesterol, in addition to all the other things it does, it's, made, it, it's used to make vitamin D and bile and so forth. It's also, the cholesterol molecule acts sort of like a hinge in your cellular membranes and allows the membranes to have a certain amount of flexibility. That's a good thing. And so if you're gonna eat an animal tissue, um, you're gonna be absorbing some of that cholesterol. Um, you will, separate from that, absorb saturated fat that stimulates your body to make more cholesterol. Now, some people have said, well, the cholesterol itself, if you, in, if you ingest that, that doesn't have a huge effect on your blood cholesterol. It, it does in fact have an effect. The egg industry has been trying to make that go away for a long time because eggs have a boatload of cholesterol in them. But we, when you look at the studies, it's really quite clear that although there is some variability from person to person, dietary cholesterol, about maybe roughly 50% of it is absorbed into your blood. And then the saturated fat, as you say, is a separate thing, but a much worse thing because it turns on your cholesterol producing machinery. So they're, they're both a problem. Um, there is zero dietary requirement for cholesterol and you're better off avoiding it. And what about for someone who's thinking, okay, I sort of, I understand that I need to eat a diverse amount of plants. I can see that it helps with the microbiome. Um, it also helps not just to like detoxify things and flush things through with fiber, as you were saying, fiber can also push out some of those calories. The polyphenols, I think feeds the healthy gut bacteria in the gut. But what about having a mostly plant-based diet with some meat and fish? Would that be problematic? Um. You know, most of us grew up with a certain amount of meat or animal products in our diet. I did. Um, my dad was a cattle rancher uh, early in life, as was his dad, as were my uncles, and pretty much the whole family tree is, is covered with them. Um, my dad did not like it. I got to tell you, he, he hated the cattle business. Actually, he left. Uh, he went to medical school after that. Um, so we're used to it. Um, and then when you suggest to a person, wait a minute, um, we've done randomized clinical trials that show that when people avoid it, they do dramatically better. When I say better, they lose weight much more easily and a substantial amount of weight. Their cancer risk goes down. If they have had cancer in the past, their survival is better. Their athletic performance quite often improves. When you say these things, they're true. But on the other hand, we're bumping up against our history, which is, wait a minute, my dad gave me roast beef. Well, my dad also smoked. Um, and we sort of have to unlearn some of the cultural things that we've grown up with, which is the notion that somehow meat has something for us that we can't get some, somewhere else. So no, uh, uh, the, the, I think there's two issues about having a little bit of animal products. The first is, for some reason, it's sort of like a little bit of smoking. Um, when a person smokes a little bit, they just don't get rid of that darn cough when they finally just 
set it aside. They do so much better. When we see patients here who have chronic weight issues, whether they're serious or not so serious, or have diabetes or have a cholesterol issue, and they're continuing to have some animal products, they may do better than they were doing before when they were having unlimited amounts. But when they get rid of that last bit, they, they, they do so much better. Somehow that last bit is what often counts. But the other thing is there's nothing like forgetting an addiction. Um, as any smoker or drinker will tell you, um, anybody who had a problem with it, the best thing is to just not go near it. Because when you, when you just forget about it, you discover the world of healthier things. And, and let me be clear. What we're talking about are serious issues. And people have been really confused over time, and I understand that. And that's why we have to do clinical trials to test what works. And once we've found it, what we're finding is not just something small. We're talking about solutions to problems that really make people miserable and in some cases take their lives. So that's the reason why we're pushing a diet that is optimal for a person's individual health. And do you think that um, people on a vegan diet can get all of the vitamins and um, minerals that they need, including things like B12 when they're avoiding meat or dairy? Uh, but, uh, it's a great question. You should supplement vitamin B12 because B12 isn't made by animals or plants. It's, it's made by bacteria. And, and you do need it. You need vitamin B12 for healthy nerves and healthy blood. And we presume, although you, nobody can really prove it, but we presume that prior to modern hygiene, the bacteria in the soil or on plants or on your fingers or in your mouth or whatever it might have been producing the 2.4 micrograms of B12 that you need, maybe. But modern hygiene has certainly taken that away. And, uh, and many people, regardless of diet, do need to supplement B12. But on a vegan diet, I, I would say everybody should be supplementing. That said, there are a lot of B12 fortified foods. You look at your breakfast cereal and many of them have B12 added, but don't rely on that for, on, on that source. You should be supplementing. But one thing that th this discussion sometimes leaves out is that a meat diet is really deficient, is a deficient diet. When we look at the, the, um, nutritional adequacy of an omnivorous diet, it's much worse than for a plant-based diet. And that's, I guess it's kind of obvious when you look at what a vegan is going to eat. Lots of vegetables, lots of fruits, um, lots of whole grains, lots of beans. They're getting vitamins, they're getting minerals, they're getting fiber, they're getting complex carbohydrate. Um, and if you compare uh, an omnivorous diet to a plant-based diet, uh, and you can use uh, Harvard's Alternate Healthy Eating Index or any other quantitative scale, and you see that the plant-based diets always do so much better. You know, meat has zero vitamin C, zero fiber, um, it's way too high in fat. So, so your nutrition is, is much better on a plant-based diet. And, and by the way, let me say, for anyone who's thinking, maybe I could go there, let me reassure you, you don't have to acquire a taste for folk music. Um, you can be vegan independent of that. And, and do you think that um, in terms of the ability to sort of synthesize B12, some of that could be done by our gut bacteria? I know, for example, if we look at folate, there's certain types of bacteria that seem to be able to produce folate. Um, on our behalf. Um, you mentioned something there about hygiene. Can you just uh, expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, some people have speculated that your gut bacteria will make B12. Well, your gut bacteria do make B12. I mean, that, that's true. But the, the question is whether the B12 they make is really going to be absorbable um, because it may well be that it's produced too far downstream to be, to be useful. Now, I've, I've often puzzled about this um, because uh, B12 is a really highly absorbable vitamin um, when it's pure, like the B12 you get in a supplement. So I think more research needs to be done on why there are people who have had no apparent dietary source other than apparently what their gut bacteria are producing and seem to do okay. In the meantime, don't fool around with it. Take a B12 supplement. They're cheap. Every pharmacy sells them. Um, I, th I think that people shouldn't be taking a chance because if, if you end up B12 deficient, you can end up with nerve symptoms that are permanent. Why would anybody do that? Um, so you can use, you can use fortified foods or take a supplement, but I wouldn't mess around with it. If you are a meat eater, you, you would need, you should be taking a B12 supplement also because many meat eaters are deficient due to lack of, um, of stomach acid or they're aging or they're on metformin or uh, they're on an acid blocker or whatever. They can often be, be low. Plus now they have to take a fiber supplement because they're low in fiber and, and they may take extra vitamin C because vitamin C isn't in animal products and so forth. 
Okay, that's interesting. So actually, for anyone that's thinking running the argument of could a vegan diet really be complete if you have to supplement, your answer would be, well, it sounds like, well, actually, even if you were eating meat, you would probably have to supplement with B12 in any event. Um, the U.S. government says that everybody, regardless of diet, should be supplementing with B12 after the age of 50. It doesn't matter if you live at the steakhouse. Um, they're going to say you should supplement B12. After the age of 50. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And is that yes, what yeah, exactly. you reduce stomach I would, acidity? I would, um, it's, well, it's just because a lot of meat eaters are low in B12, and it, we, which we presume is, is due to aging, the reduction in acidity, the use of, of drugs. We've got a whole lot of diabetes here. Metformin is the number one drug people prescribe for it. It interferes with B12 um, uh, absorption. Luckily, though, when you take the supplement, um, the absorption seems to be fine. Okay. Awesome. Um, so the next question then is, how do we get enough protein from a purely plant-based diet to protect against sarcopenia and things like that? Sure. Um, first of all, it, let's say as an experiment, well, a governmental source might say that you need roughly 50 grams of protein per day. Um, the U.S. government would say for an average man, it's about 56. For an average woman, it's about 46. But give or take a little bit, depending on your activity level and your size and stuff like that. Um, let's say you decided as an experiment, you were going to get all your protein from plants. To, well, wait, let's say you're going to get all your protein from broccoli. That's all you're going to eat. Not that you would ever do this, but let's say you eat 2000 calories a day, which would be normal. And tomorrow, all you're going to eat all day is broccoli. Add up all the protein and the broccoli you ate, and it ends up being, oh, about 147 grams. In other words, you got all the protein you need plus 100 grams of protein. Um, let's say the next day you're going to say, okay, I'm going to eat lentils. Just lentils, 2,000 calories of lentils. Now you're over 150 grams of protein per day. So hopefully you're not eating just lentils or just broccoli. But my point is, you'll have some broccoli and some lentils and some rice and, and all kinds of foods. And if you add it up, the amount of protein in these foods is enormous. Um, and uh, if you look at an elephant, elephant getting enough protein? Uh, look at a bull. Look at a stallion getting enough protein? Those are vegans. Um, they're never eating spam. They are never going to KFC. Um, they are getting all their essential amino acids from plant sources, and they are abundant in protein. And in the kind of, in the type of protein you want, let me come back to what I mentioned earlier. The Harvard researchers showed that if you decide you're going to get your essential amino acids from animal sources, your mortality is higher. If you get them from plant sources, that's better. What we believe is that the protein molecule. If you could look at it under a powerful microscope, it's, it's a chain of amino acids. And those amino acid beads that make up the protein chain have to include certain essential amino acids. But you don't want a huge boatload or excess of them because that could create issues. So if you've decided, I am no longer going to be a great ape, I'm going to be an honorary cat or dog, I'm going to pretend I eat like a lion, and I'm going to, be, I'm going to eat the carcass of a slaughtered animal, you are now getting a source of amino acids that mother nature never had in mind for you. It's the wrong set. It's not your set. Your set comes from plants. Jane Goodall, when she went to Tanzania and started looking at what the chimpanzees were eating, our, our cousins, what they were eating, you know, they, they weren't eating chicken breast. <laughs> you know, they weren't eating ice cream. They weren't, you know, what they eat is plants predominantly um, and especially fruit, huge amounts of fruit, but also leaves and lots of other things. Now, they might eat the occasional insect, and once in a while, some have been known to kill a monkey. But plants is really the great bulk of their diet. But the um, getting a variety of plants is going to be key, right, to get the full spectrum of essential amino acids, presumably. Uh, sort of. Um, if you eat one plant food, you will get all essential amino acids. Let me be clear about that, because this was misunderstood until fairly recently. And I, I, part of the blame goes to a dear person named Francis Moore LePay, who said we really ought to be plant-based because that way you can feed a hungry plant. She was right. But she wanted to say, well, but you should really eat a variety to make sure you get all the essential amino acids and, and beans are missing one and grains are missing another. That turned out not to be true. And let me say this clearly. All plants have all essential amino acids. Um, you will hear, oh, quinoa has all essential amino acids. Stop. All plants 
have all essential amino acids. Now, that said, a variety is good. Don't just eat broccoli. Don't just eat lentils. And your taste won't want to. Your brain is on the lookout for a variety of foods, which is why you get tired of one thing and you want to add something else um, so that you will get good overall nutrition. So yeah, you want a variety of foods because some of them have somewhat more and somewhat less of different essential amino acids. They, they do. But you, you're not going to become uh, amino acid deficient on a plant-based diet. <laughs> you, you will have plenty of protein. And it's, it's good to have a variety. Okay, so it's, I mean, it's interesting. So I have um, recently, ahead, I'm 48, ahead of going into menopause, I have focused on like strength training and putting on some muscle mass. I've got very lean. I think I've put on about four kilos of muscle and I've lost, not that I really had much body fat, but I lost a little bit, so I'm pretty lean. If I was now to stop, but I focused on eating quite a bit of animal protein. Um, if I was now to stop that, and decide to go on a fully plant-based diet and continue with my fitness, right? Which is a combination of low intensity, high intensity and strength training. What would you expect to see, uh, if any, in terms of changes? I expect your, uh, if you had an oncologist, he or she would be cheering for you. Um, if you had an endocrinologist, they would stand up and sing your praises. Um, because when you're eating plant-based foods, not only they are good throughout life, but at menopause, that's a time when a great many women, two things happen. Number one is hot flashes can come in and drive you insane. Um, and I'd be glad to talk about our dietary approach to hot flashes, which works out really, really well. Um, and a plant-based diet is, is part of it, although it's not all there is to it. But the other thing is that's a time when we start worrying about other things, the things that will occur in the future, uh, cancer such as breast cancer, uh, colorectal cancer. Um, these things are linked to the consumption of animal products. It's not the only, these diet isn't the only contributor, but it's a big contributor. Um, we start to be concerned about maybe a few decades down the road, could dementia be in my future like it was for my grandparents or my parents? Good heavens, if there's never been a better reason to follow a completely plant-based diet, that has got to be it. Um, because the saturated fat content of meat products is probably one of the primary drivers for our dementing illness. So um, now is a terrific time to be on as healthy a diet as one can. And so getting away from animal products is a big part of it. There are other things like taking a good look at alcohol intake and, and other things that might affect our health in other ways. Can you talk a little bit there? I want to come back to your study on hot flashes because I think um, the listeners will be very interested in that. But in relation to dementia, uh, that immediately piqued my interest. It is a flag. My mother has Alzheimer's. Can you share a little bit more there about the link between animal products and dementia, please? Well, first of all, I'm sorry that, that she's dealing with this and that the family is dealing with this. Um, it's something where we clearly need more research, but more than that, we need we, we need to get the word out about what we've, what we've already found. Um, it was 2003, it was 21 years ago, that the Chicago Health and Aging Project published the findings of a big study that they had done. Uh, people in Chicago, um, huge city, they tracked what they ate over years, and then they tracked who got dementia and who remained clear. And the first finding they had was saturated fat. Uh, saturated fat intake, if relatively robust in the diet, increased the risk of Alzheimer's by two to three fold. Let me put it the other way. If you live in Chicago and you avoid saturated fat, you cut your risk by two thirds, something like that. The number one source of saturated fat in the diet is dairy, cheese, whole milk, whole yogurt, ice cream, all those things. The number two source is meat, chicken, fish, beef, pork, all of them contain it. And then there's some saturated fat also in eggs. And unfortunately, coconut oil and palm oil too have it. So skip those. Um, there was a time when peanut butter was just peanut butter, but nowadays they'll take that jar of peanut butter and for some reason throw palm oil into it to make it more smooth. Uh, but they're just throwing saturated fat into it and you have no need for that. So avoid saturated fat, lower it down as low as you can get. And um, that helps. Now, now there's a whole lot more to this. Um, vitamin E may be helpful. Vitamin E is in seeds and nuts. Um, you don't want to go crazy with seeds and nuts because they're really pretty fatty and can make it harder to lose weight, but they do have that benefit. And in the Chicago study, vitamin E dropped Alzheimer's risk by about 50% just, just from that alone. Uh, being careful about metals, iron, copper, 
probably aluminum too. Um, those seem to affect uh, the brain. And here again, let me indict meat. When I was a kid growing up, number of decades ago, uh, we all thought you needed meat, not just for protein, but for iron. What a mistake, um, because it turns out you need some iron to make hemoglobin, so your red cells can carry oxygen. If you have too much iron, iron does what iron does. It rusts. In your body, that means it oxidizes and causes free radicals to form. If you have too much iron in your diet, which you have if you are a meat eater or if you're using your cast iron pan three times a day, um, that excess iron stimulates the production of free radicals and that causes all kinds of problems, including cardiovascular disease and dementing illness. Probably the same thing with copper. Iron and copper are transitional metals um, that, that do this and, and aluminum probably as well. I would avoid it. I would avoid anything that contains aluminum. Like if you go to a pharmacy for an antacid, don't take the ones that are made with aluminum. Uh, take the ones that are made without it, which there's plenty of them. So um, finally, lace up your sneakers and you're good with this already. But um, if people are physically active, they're oxygenating their brain. And researchers at the University of Illinois and elsewhere have shown that if you're getting good brisk exercise, brisk means moving fast enough that your heart is beating a little faster, but not so fast that you can't speak. Uh, 40 minutes of brisk exercise three times a week was enough to reverse brain shrinkage. So that's my recipe. Thank you for that. Um, a couple of things there that I just want to kind of go back over. You mentioned peanuts. Um, I, I've, I have seen that, that a lot of uh, peanut butter has been mixed with things. Unfortunately, there's quite a few brands here in the UK where they're not. In terms of nuts and seeds, do you advocate they should be soaked for better bioavailability? Do you worry about things like lectins or any anti-nutrients um, with any of these uh, plants? What, what, what's your thinking on that? No, I, I, it's, a, it's a terrific question. Thanks. I, I wouldn't worry about the lectins at all. And I wouldn't soak them if, unless you are in the mood. Um, but what I would remember is this. When nature made a walnut or an almond, um, nature put it in a tree, like out of reach. Um, and if you could climb up there and get a handful of them, they're in shells. And it's a job to get them all out of there. Um, plus, they're seasonal. So a lot of the times a year, you can't get them at all. Now, modern times, we're clever. We have factories. We have people who collect them, remove the shells, we put salt on them, we give them smokehouse flavor, and they become irresistible. Now, for your average thin person who has no weight issues, does not have diabetes, and has no hormonal issues, having a fair amount of nuts, I don't think is gonna affect them one way or the other. Um, but if you have any of those problems, if you're trying to lose weight, nuts are going to slow it down. If you're a woman with, with either menopausal issues or if you have menstrual cramps that are driving you crazy, I know this is the first time you are hearing this, but a plant-based diet, a vegan diet that is extremely low in oils, so you're not doing lots of guacamole and nuts and you're not adding oils, is for many women a dramatic life-changing experience. Okay. Interesting. And with it, so with these seeds, um, you're saying limit the amount, but you don't need to soak them. You can soak them if you're in the moon, but no, I don't think you need to soak you them. Can, you can absorb regardless. When you look at that then, and you're looking at sort of the macronutrient ratios of somebody on a fully plant-based diet, I know you're quite moderate in your approach and the way you've been speaking with fats. What would that look like in terms of composition for somebody? Well, first of all, I'm hoping that people aren't bothering to count. Um, um, I'll, I'll, get, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the numbers, but let me first just say what an optimal diet I would be would look like is one where you're eating plant fruits, fruits, vegetables, whole grains and beans, and you're not adding oils. You might have foods that have some natural oils in them, um, but you're not adding oils to anything. And if you're really trying to lose weight, I would keep the nuts and seeds off to the side for the reasons that we gave. They're just so fatty and so calorie dense. And that's it. And so I would not count calories. I wouldn't weigh portion size and I wouldn't worry about your macronutrient balance because it'll sort itself out. In the same way as if an athlete were to say to me, how much oxygen versus nitrogen should I be inhaling as I race? I'm gonna say, go to the starting line. When the pistol goes, run. That's all you have to do. 
Um, you don't, we don't need these numbers. Those numbers were contrived by people who were having trouble with their diets, where they weren't getting to where they wanted to be. So they made up things like the zone and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we shouldn't have to be preoccupied with that. But now let, let me answer your question more directly. Um, if you follow the guidance that I just laid out, fat would be less than 10% of your energy, um, uh, of your calories. Most of your calories would come from complex carbohydrate. Some simple carbohydrate is going to be there in fruits as well. And um, your protein would be adequate, maybe 10, 15% of your um, calories, and you're going to be fine. Um, you mentioned don't add fats to anything. What about things like olive oil, for example? Um, well, olive oil is great if it's in the olive. Um, you know, olives, uh, they've got polyphenols in them. Um, but in the same way as people took a factory and took sugar cane, which you can't eat very much sugar cane. If you try after about one piece or so, you're finished. You took a factory, threw away all the fiber and all the pulp and concentrated the sucrose and they sold it to you. And you know what you can do with that? You can put it in a soda, a lot of it, and you can put it in pies and cakes and people go crazy with it. If you took olives, how many would you eat? Five, six? Well, seven, maybe, but if you make a factory and you take those olives and you press out the oil and throw away all the pipe, uh, all, all, all the pulp and all the fiber and you concentrate it and you put a label on it that says the word Tuscany on it and you label it virgin, you can sell that at a good price and you can tell people this has polyphenols in it and it'll help you. It will, but it's got nine calories per gram and your weight loss is going to stop tomorrow. Um, we did a, a trial on this, um, you know, the Mediterranean diet is um, very popular and, and for good reason, because it's better than what a lot of people are following already. However, we brought in 62 people who wanted to lose weight and we randomly assigned half of them to begin a Mediterranean diet. And the Mediterranean diet as defined in research studies means mostly plant-based, but you're gonna have some, uh, some fish, some chicken, a little bit of red meat here and there, some dairy, some eggs, but not too much and olive oil will be your preferred form of fat. Um, dessert would not be pudding, it would be fruit, something like that. that's a Mediterranean diet. So half of our participants started that, the other half started a totally vegan diet, and the only rules were no animal products, keep oils, added oils really low. After 16 weeks, the Mediterranean people were, their initial enthusiasm about starting this romantic sounding diet that allowed them to imagine a sunset dinner looking out over a coastline with a glass of red wine, all those hopes had evaporated because they weren't really losing much weight. And of course we know why, because olive oil, virgin or not, has nine calories in every gram. That's true of chicken fat, that's true of fish fat. So that salmon steak that's 40% fat, if it's Atlantic salmon or 50% fat, if it's Chinook, every one of those fat grams has nine calories. So they were annoyed. They thought I, I signed up for a research study and I'm supposed to lose weight and I'm not losing. Their cholesterols didn't fall either. Makes sense because they're eating animal products. The vegans, on the other hand, initially they thought, oh my goodness sakes, um, do I have to wear tie-dyed clothes to do this vegan diet? And they soon discovered that it was okay. Um, it was easy to do. They lost weight really, really well, which is what happens on every study where we use a low-fat vegan diet. People always lose weight. Then after 16 weeks, everyone stopped. We asked them to then switch to the opposite diet. And the people who had been doing the Mediterranean diet, suddenly when they went vegan, the weight started to come off. And the people who had been vegan and now started to bring olive oil and chicken and fish into their diet as part of the Mediterranean diet they were now starting, they st the weight was coming back. And they were angry, they were annoyed. Um, and we said, well, wait, this is Mediterranean. Doesn't it sound nice? They said, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm over it. I, I, I don't want chicken wings, if you don't mind. I don't want any of that stuff anymore. I've lost my taste for fat. I don't want this. And I don't like the fact that I'm regaining lost weight. We see this with just about every, every study done with Mediterranean diets, that people don't lose weight with them unless you also do calorie restriction or intensive exercise or, or something. Because olive oil is like lard with regard to its effect on your body weight. And what about um, when we look at omega-3, for example? Um, do you find that people on a plant-based diet are getting enough of that? Do you find that their ratios of omega-3 to 6 just naturally fall in line? What have you found there? 
Yeah, well, the omega-3, there's, there's only one omega-3 that the um, body treats as an essential fat, and that's alpha-linolenic acid, and, then, and it can be lengthened to other forms like EPA and DHA. Now, that lengthening process is done by enzymes that can be slowed down. Um, and so for some people, that conversion doesn't work out very well. And the number one way you can slow down those enzymes is to have a whole bunch of other fat that preoccupies the enzymes, that ties them up. So what the, what the enzymes are looking at you saying, just let me have the alpha-linolenic acid. That's all I need. And if I can lengthen that, I'll do fine. But instead, we give them potato chips and salad oils and all kinds of other fats that they have to deal with. So you're saying it's being slowed down by the other saturated fats and things they're eating? Because They're competing. Some, uh, okay, they're competing. But some people's genetics dictate that they're not very good at that conversion and lengthening. And it can be as low as sort of 10%. Yeah, it's, it's low for everybody um, on, a, on an omnivorous diet uh, because there's so much competing fat. Um, now, let me say, if you are, if you, let's say you're concerned, what I would suggest you do is don't race out and, and buy some fish because, or whatever, if you do, you're going to be getting a lot of cholesterol. You'll get some good fat and some bad fat. You'll get some mercury and all the other things that are in that fish, plus the bad vibes of having that junk in your diet anyway. But um, what you should do or what you could do is, first of all, you could test yourself. There are companies like Omega Quant and others that will send you a card and you put a little drop of blood on it and they'll tell you your uh, uh, your status with regard to EPA and DHA in your blood. And if you're low, you, at that point, you can change your diet or you can supplement. And if you supplement, you can buy vegan DHA and vegan EPA just like fish DHA and EPA. So I'm not necessarily recommending that. Um, there are disadvantages to to uh, omega-3 supplementation. But if you wish to do it, you can do it. And it doesn't mean you can't do it on a vegan diet. You can't. Okay. But I, I should say a word for, for people who have struggled to, to lose weight, though, because this has been an obsession for many people and for good reason. Because when people have had weight issues and they've tried to lose weight, they've done it by calorie counting. And that gets old by Wednesday. You're ready to eat the sofa. Or they try to avoid carbohydrate and you think, oh, no fruit, no rice, no pasta, no bread, no cooks, no, no cookies, no cakes, da, 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 da. That gets old too. Um, and we, we, we punish ourselves when we can't support the hunger of a low calorie diet. We blame ourselves when we say, well, other people could go low carb. Why, why is it that you hate it so much? Um, or we blame ourselves if I'm not out exercising an hour and a half a day. Exercise is great. But if that's the way we're going to lose weight. Um, let's first start by putting the right fuel in. We've known for many, many years that when people are on a plant-based diet, their weight control is much better. Um, their appetite is better controlled. But in recent years, we've learned that certain specific plant-based foods cause weight loss. Now, by cause weight loss, what I mean is there are certain foods that will reduce your appetite naturally. There are certain foods, high fiber foods, that trap calories in your digestive tract and carry them out with the waste so you can't absorb them. And there are foods that will increase your after meal calorie burn. So you're burning calories substantially faster for three or four hours after the meal. These are plant foods that do that. And most exciting of all, um, these weight loss drugs, Wagovi and Ozempic that are in the news so much, uh, they're mimicking something your body is supposed to be doing. When you eat food, your body, your intestinal tract, makes GLP-1. GLP-1 is a signal. It's made in your gut. It goes to your brain, and it tells your brain, stop with the appetite already. I've got food now, so stop signaling me to be hungry. I'm not hungry. I'm eating. Okay, says the brain. I'll turn it down. So if you eat the right kinds of foods, your appetite turnoff switch will work. My research colleague here, Dr. Hanna Kaliova, an endocrinologist, uh, did an amazing study. She brought in individuals and gave them meat-based meals and found their GLP-1 response was really low. Um, the food went down. The GLP-1 receptors are supposed to, or, or uh, producing cells are supposed to be making it. A lot of nothing happened. Take the same people, start over, give them a meal high in fiber, high in complex carbohydrates as a plant-based meal, and you can watch the GLP-1 go, Bruh, boing. So we start to understand why is it that certain foods slow down my appetite and help to tame it. When we bring in individuals and we track how much they're eating, 
We ask them to eat to satiety. Eat until you're full, eat until you're, ha until you're happy, you're pushed away from the table. If you use high fiber plant-based foods and you track their GLP-1 production and you track how many calories they eat, they eat about two or 300 calories less than before. They say, I'm done, I feel, I'm feeling fine. And you say, well, wait a minute, don't you wanna eat more? I say, no, I eat my normal amount. They think they did, they really didn't. They're eating less because you are allowing them to feel a natural satiety for the first time. And this is not true. You see people who, boy, when I was a kid, I ate when I was hungry. I stop when I'm full, but now I'm kind of hungry all the time. I'm just sort of grazing. It's, it's, my appetite turnoff isn't really working. It's not working. We can fix it. And part of fixing it is give your body what it needs for this. That's the reason I wrote this new book, your, The Power Foods Diet, because there are power foods that can do all of these things. They are from plants. And if we use them, it's as delicious as carrot cake and brownies. Oh, I, yeah. Sorry, can you share with us um, what some of those foods are? You've mentioned that obviously fiber escorts some of the calories out of the body. It helps to increase satiety. Are some of these foods, um, I had Dr. Stephen Gundry on the show, and he was talking about uh, plant-based foods uncoupling your mitochondria and kind of turning your body effectively from a Prius into a Ferrari um, in terms of the calorie burn. Can you share what some of these power foods are that people can start to incorporate? Um, at Harvard University in 2015, researchers looked at the foods that were most strongly associated with weight loss in a very large group of people. Um, by associated with weight loss, what I mean is the more the people included these foods in their routine, the more they increased their consumption of these, the more weight they lost. And there are many, many of them, but just real quick, at the top of the list was the unassuming blueberry um, and, and, and his cousins. Uh, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, blackberries. Number two were cruciferous vegetables. So that would be broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. Uh, number three was green leafy vegetables in general. Um, so that might include things like spinach or asparagus. Uh, num number Group number four was the melons. So cantaloupe or watermelon or, or others. And you can start to see some patterns here. Okay, melons, a lot of water, a lot of fiber, not a whole lot of calories. Um, number five was citrus fruits, and that could be surprising. Oranges, can, uh, 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 well, anything in the citrus group, but the, the surprise was that juices worked too, because a lot of people will malign juice. Oh, I don't have juice. It didn't matter. It could have been grapefruit, could have been orange juice, even the, 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 the juices and the fruits both worked. And, and group number five was the humble bean, beans, peas, and lentils. Um, and they're, of course, the highest fiber foods of all. So a little bit goes a really long way. Um, and what's remarkable about all these foods, they're typically high in carbohydrate, typically complex carbohydrate, lots of fiber, uh, a good amount of protein, but not an excess and not a deficiency. Um, and uh, they're cheap and they taste good. We also, by the way, did a study on how much people spend. And we discovered when they eat an entirely plant-based diet, they, their food costs drop by about 16%. Mm. They, they, they are spending more on vegetables and more on fruits, but they're spending like nothing yeah, on I mean, cheese and meat and so forth. so expensive. So expensive. Right. Um, Not as expensive for us as for the environment, but it's pretty expensive, yes. When you... Um... What about, uh, I'm curious as to your view on this, when people are eating fruit, for example, or a type of um, whole food, so not a processed carbohydrate, but a whole food that spikes their blood glucose. So for example, if I have watermelon, love it, uh, if I have carrot juice, right, and I wear a CGM, I'm going to see a big rise in my blood glucose. Uh, the thing that we're hearing all the time now is to minimize and flatten the curve and to keep yourself within this very strict range. What are your thoughts around that? Um, first of all, your body is designed, if I can use that term, to use glucose as its favorite fuel. So glucose goes to your brain and allows you to think. It's what allows you to wake up in the morning. Glucose goes into your muscles and it's your power. You know, you're, if, you, if you're gonna run that marathon, glucose is your muscle's favorite thing of all. So glucose is not a bad thing, glucose is a good thing. Um, but glucose cannot enter your muscle cells or your liver cells without the help of insulin. And so the insulin hormone made in your pancreas goes to the surface of your muscle cells 
and it opens up that cell to allow the glucose inside. Now for a lot of people, well, for, for everybody, normally your blood glucose will rise after a meal, but if it rises and it falls because the glucose, let's face it, it went in your stomach, it's going into your blood and it's going then into the muscles and going to the liver, that takes a little time. So a normal blood sugar rise is normal and nothing to worry about. Um, for some reason, for, for some people, their blood sugar is staying up persistently and it's, it just won't go down. And these people may have prediabetes or, or frankly, diabetes. Why? Sugar is not the cause of diabetes. What causes diabetes is it follows from insulin resistance. Insulin resistance means that if I look in that muscle cell, it's not able to take glucose out of the blood quickly because the muscle is filled with fat particles, microscopic fat particles. Wait, what's that about? We ate cheese pizza or a sausage and egg sandwich, and the fat from those foods got into our muscle cells. This is not thigh fat or belly fat. It's microscopic fat particles inside the muscle cells. When the cell is filled with fat particles, the insulin can no longer work. That cell is insulin resistant. Now, anything you eat, no matter how healthy or unhealthy, that has carbohydrate in it, is going to spike your blood sugar because your cell, because your body's not working right. Your body can't shuttle that glucose where it belongs. Um, so the answer to that is not to avoid healthy foods. The answer to that is to get the fat out of your cells. To get the fat out of your cells, stop eating animal products completely. That will eliminate animal fat and stop adding oils to everything and justifying it as, oh, it's a natural thing that's organic. And, uh, you know, have only the oils that are intrinsic to foods like green vegetables and so forth. Those little traces of oils, that's all you need. With time, when we use magnetic resonance spectroscopy to look inside the muscle cells, you can see that the fat is going away. Same thing in your liver. And as that fat goes away, your cells can respond to that sugar again. This is the treatment of choice for type one diabetes, but it is the diet of choice for everybody because it allows your body to use glucose in the way it's supposed to. Okay, so what you're saying is, okay, you can improve that over time. I, I had seen that there was a study that if you see spikes, that is worse for you than somebody who has perpetually slightly elevated blood glucose. Are you saying that if you take the fat out, actually your insulin sensitivity is going to improve and you're not even going to get such big spikes? This, uh, both things are true. Um, the chronic blood sugar levels will come down and the spikes will come down too. Okay, great. I mean, th th there, there's always going to be a change. Um, you know, your blood glucose will always change. It comes up after a meal and it'll even come up early in the morning. If you check your blood sugar at four in the morning, you go back to sleep and check it at 6.30, you know, two and a half hours later, it's gone up. You haven't eaten anything. Your liver is releasing sugar. So it's gonna go up and down all the time. But to get your blood sugar machinery working right, you want the animal products out of your diet. Okay, and what about, you mentioned fortified foods. I heard you say on, on Bartlett's podcast that bread is always better than chicken. What do you, what's your position on processed carbohydrates? Do you mean, uh, so, do you like, mean st starches that are broken down to sugars or something like that? Yeah, so like, for example, eating things like bread uh, or pasta. Fine. What matters is what you put on them. Um, if that pasta has, um, you know, a half an inch of ground beef on top, that's the problem. That's the reason people are, are gaining weight. If a person is concerned about processed food, there is the number one most processed food is chicken. Because what is chicken? A chicken is an animal slaughtered at six weeks of age. During all of those six weeks, that chicken has been fed corn. Um, you took corn and used a chicken as a machine. You put the, the corn in the chicken's mouth and the amylase in the saliva starts to break apart the carbohydrate, goes down into the crop in the animal, waits there for a little while, and then it goes into the rest of the digestive tract to break down the proteins and rearrange the amino acids to increase the saturated fat content from 14% to about 30% um, to eliminate all of the fiber, to eliminate all the complex carbohydrates. And then this, then this product shows up at the store. Animals on farms are used as machines to process grains into a form that is more marketable and more expensive. So, and that's true with a cow. You could feed corn to a cow and you can get um, milk out of the cow. 
um, or and you can get muscle tissue out of the cow. In each case, you're taking a, health, a more healthful food and making a less healthful, highly processed food. So anybody who's eating chicken or fish or any animal product, the animal is a machine that processes foods dramatically more than you could do by stamping corn into cornflakes. Unless you're having like pasture-raised grass-fed beef, right? Um, no, 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 it doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, the, the cow is a machine designed by the cow's evolution and human manipulation to turn plants into products that have a huge economic value. And so you can put a cow out on the pasture and the cow will take green leafy vegetables, whatever's there on the pasture, and transform them into animal muscle. And the farmer does that because the farmer makes money doing that. But that is a heavily, heavily processed food. Uh, thank you. I know you've been really generous with your time here. Um, and uh, I know you have something else to go to. So before you go, please share the, the study on hot flashes. I think many people will be interested in this um, and the dietary protocols. Where can, where can listeners find out more about that? Or do you want to share a very quick summary of it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. If you have hot flashes, don't take my word for this. Just try this. Um, and bottom line, the, result, the results were published twice in the journal Menopause by the North American Menopause Society. Um, and you can see the details on our website, pcrm.org. Go there and just search hot flashes or menopause, and you'll hear me talking about it. But in, in a nutshell, um, when we've looked around the world, we've seen that people on plant-based diets have much fewer hot flashes than others. And women consuming soybeans have fewer hot flashes than women who, women who don't. Um, but it doesn't have to be soybeans. Uh, women in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico eat black beans, not soybeans, and they have far fewer hot flashes. So we did a randomized clinical trial with 84 participants. And we did three things, and all three are important. No animal products, no added oils, and a half a cup of cooked soybeans every day. The moderate to severe hot flashes were reduced by 88%. That's about what HRT will do. But people also lost weight. And because soybeans are associated with a reduction in cancer risk, let me repeat that in, people, in case people think I misspoke, because soybeans reduce the likelihood of getting breast cancer, and soybeans reduce the likelihood of cancer killing you. Soybeans are a cancer preventer. You're setting yourself up in your most postmenopausal years to be your healthiest ever. So all three of these were great. Um, I wrote about this in a book um, called Your Body in Balance. Um, and it was women who had used this approach who kept writing to us that caused us to decide to do this randomized clinical trial. So all three are important. No animal products, keep veg vegetable oils really, really low, and have the half a cup of cooked soybeans. For some people, they're cured in about a week, but give it longer. It could be as much as four or five weeks before you see the result. That's very quick. And you're not worried about the monocrop farming of soy and the processing, just how much we have of it. Um, if a person instead goes to the pharmacy and gets HRT, you're going to get a whole bunch of papers to read about why you shouldn't be too worried about the increased risk of cancer that is going to come from HRT. Um, no, there's, <laughs> there's no issue with soy products. And if a woman is doing this, have your husband eat it too, because soy products also reduce the risk of prostate cancer. Anyway, awesome. give it a try. I hope people enjoy it. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been uh, such a pleasure having you on and just learning all about the power of plants. Um, the Power Foods Diet is now, I think, as we're recording this out tomorrow on Audible and Kindle in the UK. I'm going to show it to you. There it is. It's the hot coffee. Amazing. Yeah. I hope people give it a, get a chance to give it a try, try the recipes and see what happens. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming on the show. Nice speaking with you. Thank you so much.